Ed, I'm not sure. You're on tape, Charlie. Go ahead. Welcome to the college. Yeah. You got one, one rule. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, we have tonight with us a, a speaker who has been a peacenik. He has a, a student peace union card from the uh, early 60s. And uh, one of our buttons, I remember I was active in the Student Peace Union too. I remember there was one guy from Chicago who used to come to meetings. We called him Shorty. He was about the you know, tower. Uh, and he taught me the uh, conditions of the just war. And if you really strongly ask all the questions of that of the just war theory uh, asks, uh, there wouldn't be any war. So, uh, before you went to war. Well, uh, so, uh, well, let's see. He's also an author and a, a Zen priest, and uh, he's got a temple. Uh, down the street here, uh, and uh, he, he teaches, and he's written books, and, uh, and he will be our speaker tonight. I didn't think we'd ever get around. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so, my name is Tegan Layton. I'm here uh, and very honored to be at the College of Complexes to talk about, uh, well, socially engaged Buddhism. So, uh, as uh, the introducer said, I uh, have been a peace activist and social activist going back to the mid 60s. Um, so, it's more recent than that, only close to 40 years that I've also been a Zen Buddhist meditator, um, and somehow they fit together for me. So I want to talk today about uh, Buddhism and meditation and how that supports uh, social activism. So just to uh, add to the introduction, I, I'm the teacher down the uh, street here, half a block at the Ancient Dragon Zen Gate uh, Temple. There's a flyer here about that. You're all welcome to come to meditation instruction or to talks there. Um, I'm also here representing a Buddhist Peace Fellowship, which is uh, a, an inter uh, a, a group of many different Buddhist organizations, Buddhist sanghas or communities that meet together to in, be involved in uh, social action, social Can I take activist it, uh, programs. I'm just show you some dessert. So. Um, what I want to say is that we um, uh, try to respond to problems in our society from, well, I'll speak for myself, um, but are there are other people here from the Buddhist Peace Fellowship who can add to this. Um, so I, I see our response to uh, social situations and problems in our society as coming from a moral perspective rather than from partisan politics. So from my own perspective, um, our current government and society is um, highly corrupt, controlled by big corporations, uh, the, the, the big banks, the fossil fuel and energy corporations, control our government, our media, and our so-called justice systems. Uh, the question is how to respond. What is the way to respond that <clears throat> is helpful, that may be effective, that also responds from a place of, um, from a Buddhist perspective of meditative inner calm that supports patience and that supports a long-term perspective. So for me, um, well, I'll say a little bit more about my history of activism. I uh, was involved in opposing the Vietnam War when I was a, in my uh, mid-teens and before the uh, anti-Vietnam movement was uh, a widespread movement. Uh, I was involved with uh, uh, college uh, 
uh, uh, protests and uh, was involved with SDS and saw how destructive anger was in terms of uh, being effective and being helpful in terms of responding to social situations. So for me, part of uh, um, finding a way to respond to problems in our society was a, a long process of seeing how to turn um, that feeling of anger and outrage about what has been going on in our society for a long time and to something productive. And part of that is how to avoid uh, burnout and the feeling of being overwhelmed. So uh, from my long practice and, and now teaching of Buddhist meditation and Buddhist uh, teaching perspectives, uh, I have experienced and seen in others that developing a practice of uh, meditation and of other Buddhist practices, that one can develop a kind of inner calm, a kind of patience, and part of that is having a, a wider perspective on time. So maybe for all of us growing older helps that. Um, you know, back when I was 18, I thought we would have a revolution. You know, in the next couple of years, uh, and I thought I knew. I thought I knew all the answers. And you know, now I see that we're, we're, that all of this is a longer proposition. Um, and I guess we all know that uh, part of Buddhist teaching it actually helps to see that. So I'm part of a Buddhist tradition that goes back 2,500 years. And of course, corruption and uh, all the problems in our society, the problems we have now with the big corporations, the problems that we have now with uh, endless wars and so forth, are not something that just happened you know, in the last century. They, they, this has to do with our national karma of slavery, of um, genocide of Native Americans, of racism. So, you know, in some ways, maybe as bad as I think things are now, maybe they've been worse, or maybe they're always bad. Uh, so I can make the argument that things are uh, very bad now, and I'm going to talk about that. But in some ways, there's always injustice. How do we respond in a healthy way? How do we respond in an effective way? These are the questions that concern me. And I think concerns engage Buddhists. So, uh, so maybe I'll say a little bit. So uh, I'll just add, first of all, uh, that part of, part of this has to do with a sense of flexibility about how to respond. That there's not one right tactic, there's not one right way to respond that we each have our own way to respond to the problems in our society. And that persistence is very important. How do we develop persistence? And the uh, and this is actually a practice. It's not you know, something we can just decide right away. But how do we actually develop the willingness and readiness to persist in opposing that which is harmful to ourselves, this is our society, masses of people in our society. Um, so this involves, uh, to me, this is very much connected to the kind of uh, spiritual practice that I do and that I teach. There may be other, of course, other traditions that also promote a kind of healthy uh, responsiveness, a kind of patient responsiveness, but it involves flexibility and persistence. So uh, I'm, I'm here speaking. Uh, in, in part on behalf of uh, Chicago Buddhist Peace Fellowship. So I want to say a little bit of, about our chapter just by way of um, uh, responding to that. So again, um, the, the temple we have down the street, Ancient Dragon Zen Gate, is from the Japanese Soto Zen Buddhist tradition. There are as many different forms of Buddhism, actually many, many more forms of Buddhism that there are forms of Christianity. Uh, so, uh, and and uh, the Buddhist Peace Fellowship is open to uh, people from many different Buddhist traditions. Uh, the Buddhist Peace Fellowship chapter of Chicago meets 
the third Thursday of every month, uh, 7.45 at uh, the Asian Dragons and Gate Temple. And just some of the things that that chapter's been doing is to support various actions in Chicago. We supported the NATO protest, and, and some of us marched with that. Uh, we've been involved in actions concerning Burma and Tibet as Buddhists. We felt like we wanted to support uh, productive um, responses there. We supported Occupy. Uh, in 2011, we were uh, down at LaSalle and Jackson doing meditations every week. We um, have organized talks by leading engaged Buddhists. Uh, David Loy was here, and Alan Sanaki, who's uh, been very one of the le leading engaged Buddhists from, from Berkeley, uh, but who travels in Asia, is going to be at DePaul University Sunday, July 28th, 2.30 to 4.30 p.m. Um, Shoto Spring um, uh, is um, a Zen teacher also in a similar, a related tradition to mine. Um, but she's going to be speaking, uh, co-sponsored by Chicago Buddhist Peace Fellowship. And there's a flyer here about this Monday evening, June 17th. And she's um, doing this compassionate earth walk uh, along the route of the Keystone XL, proposed Keystone XL pipeline. So uh, she's doing a, a long walk, and there's a flyer about that up here. So I want to particularly recommend that. That's uh, Monday evening. Uh, June 17th. Um, so, um, and I want to come back to that in a second. One, so we, we've done other, other uh, Chicago BPF has done other, uh, working with other groups, for example, a group of, pro, an interfaith group of protest chaplains who've been involved with various actions, including um, anti-drone action at the Chicago Air Show. Um, coming back to um, Shoto's talk, though, and her compassionate earth walk, um, one of the announcers spoke about uh, the Keystone XL pipeline and President Obama's visit. So I want to talk more about the environment, because for, for me anyway, there, there, there's so many issues going on now. There's so many issues, and this is part of the problem. We can easily feel overwhelmed and you know, feel like there's nothing we can do because there's so many issues. So I want to talk about that that question about how do we respond to just the fact of so many problems. Um, but, you know, one of them that, that moves me is just the problem of the environment and how urgent that is, uh, particularly in terms of the climate damage and nuclear power. Uh, so the Keystone XL pipeline, which I'll talk more about, uh, is extremely dangerous. Uh, and President Obama single-handedly can just end stop that. Uh, and as uh, the uh, introductor mentioned, uh, President Obama is going to be at a fundraiser this Wednesday uh, at the Hilton Hotel on South Michigan Avenue in Salvo, 4.30. And people are gathering to help support him to say no to the Keystone XL pipeline. He's under tremendous pressure from all of the fossil fuel companies to say yes. So, so I want to talk a lot more about that. But I, just, to, just to announce that that's a place where you can go and speak against and stand up and be present and witness against that. So uh, that was a little bit about the Chicago Buddhist Peace Fellowship chapter and what we do. What's your dinner, sir? So uh, stepping back from those specifics, I want to talk uh, about the Buddhist tradition, what it means, and why, and how it fits in with um, responding to social issues. So somebody was asking me before, when I, I got here a little bit early, and there was a question about, well, don't, don't monastics stay in the monastery, and, and you know, well, how can you be involved in meditation and, and still you know, respond to issues uh, in the world? Um, and, it, and I actually have spent a few years in a monastery in California myself, and I've done a, and spent some time in a monastery in Japan, and that is part of the Buddhist tradition. Uh, in, for Buddhist monastics, part of that tradition ready, of going pretty far back mm -hmm. is yes. to go into the monastery and spend time reflecting on one's own, uh, we could say, internal conflicts. Um, 
but then also to come back out and to respond to the situations in the world. So uh, our meditative practice is not just about taking care of ourselves. So one of the, uh, and I can go into some of the history of all this and the different branches of Buddhism, and I, I have been, at, you know, I, I do, one of my hats is as a uh, comparative religion professor. I taught at Loyola for, for four years recently. Um, but um, so I won't go into a you know a history lesson, but just very basically the branch of, of uh, Buddhism that that I'm involved with is, is involved with bodhisattvas, which are enlightening beings who intentionally stay in the world. So uh, we're dedicated to working for the well-being of all beings in the world. This, of course, directly involves uh, responding to the suffering of beings in the world, and that uh, involves uh, all the beings within us personally, all the beings we interact with, family, friends, co-workers, neighbors, but also in, in the society around us. Uh, so this is a, an old tradition, but in modern Buddhism, both in the West and in Asia, it's particularly been applied to social action. So this is part of Buddhism today, very much so. So this is dedicated to the awakening of all, of all beings, the relief and suffering of all beings. And that includes of, of, um, focusing on one's own suffering, one's own confusion, uh, and greed, and anger. <coughs> and how we deal with that. So that's part of the question of how to respond uh, wholesomely to these issues. Um, so we have various ethical precepts. Some of them sound a little bit like the Ten Commandments, but they're not, thou shalt not, they're more like guidelines to how do we deal with the complexities of living in the world. Um, so. For example, a disciple of Buddha does not kill. That also means how do we support others not to kill. That also means how do we support life and lively and liveliness and vitality for all beings. So, um, so there's this ethical dimension, which includes looking at ourselves, but also looking at what's going on in the world, and then how do we respond. And part of what happens in a uh, in, in, in being engaged in a regular practice of meditation, which can include sitting meditation, walking, uh, chanting, um, various, uh, various kinds of meditation, part of what happens is that we start to have a deeper awareness of what is possible. We start to develop our own capacity our own patience, our own tolerance for responding in, in different ways, in new ways. We develop what's sometimes called skillful means to be more flexible, to be able to be more effective. It doesn't mean to necessarily know what to do all the time or how to be effective, but to try things, to be more able to be open to new responses. So having been involved in various you know, discussions of, between various leftist factions back in you know, the 60s and so forth, you know, there was lots of discussion about this tactic or that tactic, and I find that pretty fruitless. Um, each of us has our own way to respond to the difficulties in the world. Each of us has our own issues that may move us to respond, and all of it may be helpful. We don't know what will be helpful. One perspective in Buddhism is that there is change, period, that things change, including whatever situations we may deplore in, in the world today. So the control of our government and of our courts and so forth by the big banks, for example, of the, our economy by the big banks, uh, this isn't sustainable. I mean, it looks pretty, it's pretty entrenched right now, but long term, this isn't sustainable. Uh, the destruction of the middle class, the effect on uh, young people who are coming out of college with huge debts and no jobs. This is not a sustainable society. So how is it going to change? Well, what we do makes a difference. 
So we don't know what is the we don't know what the right response is, but we know that things will change. So Buddhism encourages uh, nonviolence, and and uh, the key to nonviolence for me is respectfulness. How do we respect the whole process? How do we respect everyone involved? How do we even respect the possibility that some of the heads of the big banks and the big corporations might actually see the light and, and, and change what they're doing? It's possible. It seems, you know, it seems like that would be pretty difficult. But anyway, and that's that we shouldn't wait for that to happen. Of course. Yeah, but so, okay, what's possible? Uh, so part of nonviolence is also to, to, to look at our own negative emotions. So I was talking about the kind of anger and outrage that um, you know, many of us kind of reacted against in terms of uh, protests and social action back, back in the day. Uh, Buddhism teaches, and, and you know, other, other spiritual traditions as well, um, but our, our spiritual practice teaches us how to transform negative emotions. So I like that, you know, that old bumper sticker, uh, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. So what do we do when we're angry or, or outraged at, at what's going on around us? And it may not be just, uh, you know, we can look at what's going on in, you know, in Washington, or we can look at things going on in institutions in Chicago, or in things going on, you know, closing in schools. There's so many, you know, there's so many places we could feel that. What do we do with that? What do we do when we see something in our own workplace where uh, somebody's doing, where there's somebody acting in a way that's harmful? Uh, so, um, my experience is that anger and outrage is kind of self-corrosive. Um, if we if we get caught up in that, you know, part of our part of our somebody was talking to me earlier about meditation and saying, well, that's just sort of mental, and no, it's actually a physical process. To actually sit present and upright is a physical process, a yogic process. So we see physically how those feelings and emotions affect us, and how our you know, our, for example, our throat tightens up, or you may have some other other tightening that happens around anger. The point is to transform those emotions. And there are ways in which they naturally transform. So anger and outrage, for example, can be transformed to vow, determination, resolve, to persist in, in looking at the situation that allowed you to feel your anger and patiently watching to see how you can respond. So for example, I'm upset with, um, very upset with what's happening to our climate. We are, you know, 350.org and Bill McKibben have talked about how dangerous uh, what's happening to our climate is, and now we're at 400. Uh, and, and there are still politicians paid, or paid by fossil fuel companies who are say, pretending that there's no climate change happening. Well, look at the size of the tornadoes, look at the size of storm in, in New Jersey, look at the, you know, the, it's just happening all around us, all over the world. And these people are still pretending, and, and not just pretending, but brainwashing the American people. There's no other word for it. And spending millions of dollars to, in the media to, to convince, to persuade people that, well, this is, this is just a debatable, you know, there's no scientific proof. It's just, it's, it's um, so I can get really angry. <laughs> but the point is, what do we do about it? And um, so I went to uh, uh, a gathering in Washington, D.C. in February, which I'll talk about a little bit, to, uh, to uh, try and persuade President Obama to stop the Keystone XL pipeline, which will be very dangerous in terms of bringing in tar sands. Well, we have this opportunity Wednesday here in Chicago to go and express ourselves, just go down to at uh, 4.30 p.m. to South Michigan and Bill and Balbo and be present there. Um, some, of, some of you can't be there because you have other obligations at that time, but if you can be there, that's something we can actually do, just to go there and be present. And, um, so, you know, how do, we, how do we resolve to look for opportunities to say something? 
and you know, writing to Congress people, writing to the president, calling in. These are opportunities. So there, there are many um, other negative oper negative emotions, greed, you know, uh, and desire can be transformed transforms to dedication and devotion. So we can be devoted to, for example, social justice. Uh, confusion can be can be transformed to clear analytical study of what's going on and how to uh, how to see that and understand that and share that with others. So again, to respond with respectfulness to the whole situation that we're concerned about uh, is empowering. It allows us to pay attention. To be patient, but patience doesn't patience does not mean being passive. It means being attentive, aware, studying, and then responding when there's a way to respond. So um, there's a lot more I can say about all of that and how it relates specifically to meditation practice and other practices and how. It, and also how it applies to our own inner work, because that's part of it too. You know, all of the things that are happening in terms of the injustice in our society, in terms of you know the, the problems in our environment, are connected to us too. Our own patterns of consumption and so forth. Uh, it's not just those bad guys out there. It's a continuum. We're all part of this. So. Um, you know, we have to look at ourselves as well. And then how do we respond to all of what's going on? Uh, but I do want to take some time to, to talk specifically about um, climate damage and nuclear power. Um, uh, so, um, well, I'll say just a little bit about nuclear power. Um, so you've all probably heard about Fukushima and the meltdowns there. They're still happening. Uh, the Fukushima reactors that are melting down now uh, were built by General Electric. The, the General Electric yeah. Mark I reactors that melted down in, in Fukushima um, were, their meltdown was predictable, was predicted, they were unsafe. There are 23 or 24 of those reactors in the United States that are older than the ones that were, were at Fukushima that are worn down. So I want to strongly urge everyone to read a book called Devil's Tango by Cecile Pineda, P-I-N-E-D-A. It's about Fukushima, but it's also about um, the whole nuclear power industry and how unsafe it is. There are nuclear power plants all around this country that are that are that have been shown to be unsafe and the whole regulatory process and the safe, supposed safety regulations are forced and this, does anybody know which state has the most nuclear power plants in it no. No. good you know anyway i want to strongly recommend so i'm not going to say too much about this except that um, this book is, um, has a lot of documentation about what has happened in Fukushima and how it affects all of us. The whole northern hemisphere is affected. Um, the, for example, the infant mortality rate in uh, northwestern United States increased dramatically as a direct result of the radiation in Fukushima. Large parts of Japan maybe even including Tokyo, are functionally uninhabitable. Of course, they can't just uh, you know, abandon it because there's no place to, for those people to go. Uh, this is a major global catastrophe. And of course, you're not going to read about it you know, in the New York Times or in mass media. But uh, it behooves all of us to know about it. And this book is, just, is aside from giving lots of documentation, it's a, wonderful, poetic, and philosophical uh, description of what it means about all of us. So, please read this. Um, 
So, you know, these issues about the environment, for me, you know, as passionate as I was about the Vietnam War in the 60s, I feel this way about the environment. Um, and I feel like, you know, um, I don't know what to do. Um, one of the things that I have found that I can do is to talk about it, sometimes. So, at my temple down the street, I talk about this stuff sometimes. <laughs> I, don't try, I don't talk about it all the time. <laughs> People wouldn't show up because it's just too much, you know. I talk about, you know, so I also talk about all, all Buddhist meditation teachings and all teaching stories, and I love that stuff. So, you know, that's, I'm happy to talk about other things. But tonight here, I'm going to talk about it. Uh, and actually, tomorrow morning, I'm going to talk about some of this stuff, too. Um, so, I, so there's talks every Sunday, e Sunday morning and Monday evening at the temple. Um, Okay, climate change. So I want to just talk about some of the things that are happening with that. Um, there's so many other issues, though. Just to say, you know, there's the what the banks are doing, and the fact that there's no none of the uh, you know nobody from the big banks that are that are too big to fail or to put in jail. You know, none of them. You know, they're still receiving tax uh, credits. Uh, People are still, they're still foreclosing on mortgages that shouldn't be foreclosed on. I mean, what's going on in our society on so many levels is so outrageous. Well, of course, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe our society has been outrageous for a long time. Um, you know, there was slavery, there was, you know, genocide of the Native Americans, so I don't know. But the scale of what this means in terms of our planet being a dangerous place for humans to live for for your grandchildren and their grandchildren is so crucial right now. So some of what some of what I want to say now is, is are things that I you know uh, heard and, and said around the time in February when I went to Washington D.C. I uh, spent an, uh, about 12 hours on a bus. Uh, from here, along with some other folks organized by the Sierra Club, and 12 hours back to go to this rally in D.C. in February, organized by Bill McKibben and the Sierra Club. Um, one of the things that Bill McKibben talks about is how, uh, and, and you can go to 350.org to find out all about this stuff, uh, the business plan of the fossil fuel industry this includes, you know, very much the tar sands, this oil that's coming from Canada via the Keystone Pipeline. It includes the deep sea drilling. It includes, certainly includes the fracking and the coal. Uh, but the, the whole business plan of the fossil fuel industry as a whole will certainly release far more carbon into the atmosphere in the next several decades than will be able to sustain human life. That's their business plan. So, you know, the fossil fuel industry, we could compare it to the tobacco industry. Now, if you think change can't happen, I remember when I told this story, I remember when I was 17 and I learned to smoke cigarettes. And I was so proud of myself, you know. It took a while, you know, to actually be able to inhale and smoke a cigarette. And, you know, it was, and that meant I was an adult and it was glamorous then, you know. And now, you know, there's nobody in this, in this restaurant smoking cigarettes, and I, maybe some of you smoke, and I don't mean to be, you know, he's, he's leaving to go, go out and get a cigarette. <laughs> and I don't, you know, I don't mean to, you know, addiction is a powerful thing. So I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not denigrating anyone. We, we're all addicted to fossil fuel. Um, but, you know, the way that tobacco was shown to be an intentional addictive substance, that the, that the Tobacco companies were were pushing consciously on children, you know. And, and um, anyway, the fossil fuel company, the fossil fuel companies are, you know, worse, if anything. Um, so you know, how do we? So so people are organizing against the fossil fuels, as Bill McKibben has been doing, uh, in terms of, uh, or, you know, doing things like going down to. Um, on Wednesday to, uh, to or, 
urge him to say no to the Keystone Pipeline. That's not going to solve the problem, but it'll give a, it'll be one good, strong signal. He's under tremendous pressure from all the money and all the power of the fossil fuel companies. I don't know if he'll do it. He said a few good things about climate change in some of his speeches, but people are are responding, you know, and. Uh, the planet is a, this is a, you know, from the perspective of Zen Buddhist philosophy and meditative awareness, this planet is alive. And people uh, opposing what's going on are like the living antibodies of the planet kicking in to fight uh, the fever. The Arctic is melting, you know, the half of the Arctic uh, polar caps is gone this last year. It's really serious. Um, so this is something that, that President Obama can do on his own. He doesn't need the Congress. He doesn't have to, you know. Um, um, you know, there was, we've had these, these huge tornadoes. The tornadoes are not caused by climate change, but the size of the tornadoes. that just flattened that town in Oklahoma. The size of Superstorm Sandy that happened late last year in the decimated parts of New Jersey and all that. You know, this is this is um, this is directly, clearly a result of, of climate change. Um, uh, so you know, there's just there's no doubt about this in terms of science. Um, so I have a, a long quote from James Hansen, who's a NASA climate scientist. Um, he says. Just a little bit of it. The chances of getting a late October hurricane in New York without the help of global warming is extremely small. In that sense, you can blame Hurricane Sandy on global warming. And if the Keystone Pipeline goes through, you know, this is, this is a, a catastrophic. Um, uh, some other information about this. Um, and I want to give time for questions and discussion. Um, but um, you know, again, presidential decisions often are less significant than we imagine, and you know, I I feel you know that I sympathize to some extent with President Obama's you know the limitations of his power. I think there are lots of things he could be doing that he isn't. But anyway, in the case of the Keystone Pipeline, because it's an international border, he could just decide to do this. Um, the Al Alberta tar sands are the continent's biggest carbon bomb. Bill McKibben said if you could burn all the oil in the tar sands, you'd run the atmosphere's concentration of carbon dioxide from its current 390 parts per million. This was written a while ago. And only 600 parts per million. This would mean it's not held in at least a world with a similar temperature. Um, if the Keystone XL fails to win the president's approval, the industry will certainly grow at a far slower pace than forecast, possibly witness the failure of costly ventures, resulting in an industry-wide contraction. Anyway, um, so there are things that can be done. We don't know what will make the difference. Um, again, from the perspective of uh, seeing change and seeing time from a wider perspective, uh, and from the point of view of cause and effect, which is another basic Buddhist teaching, that everything that happens does have causes. It's not random. It's not, uh, you know, things happen as a result of karma and causes. And everything we do has an effect. So uh, what we do will make a difference. And again, we don't know how to respond to all of this. Uh, so, you know, one of the things I do, I believe in preaching to the choir. Uh, I think it's very helpful that we talk about this stuff to each other. And there are so many other issues I haven't, I haven't talked about that I'm sure um, many of us are concerned about. But the point is that through patience, through attentiveness, through being willing to not just withdraw into feeling hopeless and helpless, that that we do can, can and do make a difference, and we don't necessarily see how that how that difference happens. Um, 
<laughs> Maybe I'll close. I'll close with a story that I heard from Dan Ellsberg. Um, uh, one thing I did, maybe the, one of the things I'm proudest of in, in my life was uh, before I moved here in the beginning of 2007, I was living in Berkeley, and uh, there was a fellow named John Yu. Have any of you heard of him? Uh, he wrote the torture memo for uh, George W. Bush, which is still in operation. We're still torturing people in Guantanamo. Guantanamo is still holding their, their people in hunger fast who are being force fed, which is defined in the world in the world court as torture. Um, and uh, these are people who, many of whom have not only never been charged for the crime, but have already been recognized as being uh, okay to release. And yet they're still uh, incarcerated in Guantanamo. Um, but back in 2006, uh, John Yu still is teaching constitutional law at the University of California at Berkeley, where I was, I was living near there. Nobody was doing anything about it then. Since then, there have been demonstrations and uh, so I organized a weekly um, teach-in in front of the law school there. Dan Ellsberg amongst other people spoke. Uh, anyway, he told a story that maybe some of you have heard about um, after Nixon was elected president and the war in Vietnam continued despite what he had said when he was running. And there was a, there was a day when Nixon and Secretary Kissinger were sitting in the Oval Office and um, Nixon decided to drop atom bombs on Hanoi. He decided to do it. But he looked out his window and there were over 100,000 protesters protesting the Vietnam War. And he turned to Henry Kissinger and said, well, maybe we shouldn't do this today. Maybe we shouldn't do this now. Now, uh, what they put out to the press was that he was busy watching a football game and he didn't even know about the protesters. And probably many of those protesters went home and thought, well, what's the point of, of doing this? But they actually stopped the dropping of an atom bomb. So I'll close with that. So I, I don't know how the, what the format is now. Questions? Ram, Ram, yes. moderate. And I see Jeff Schramick has his hand up, and so does Dave Taylor. Jeff? Yes, sir. I sort of lost you at the end there as to what the demonstrations in front of the White House have to do with John Yu. Oh, no, I just was, I was just talking about we don't know what, uh, I, I just was mentioning res doing something to respond. And, I, and that's how I happened to hear the story from Dan Ellsberg, because he came to that in those... He was speaking at those demonstrations. That's how I heard that story. Okay, so John, you had nothing to do with anything. No, John, you was not involved in dropping Adam Fox. No, no, no I mean, uh, uh, he had nothing to do whatsoever with the story about. No, Dan Ellsberg had to, had to, yeah, that was me. So. Okay, uh, Dave Travis. Uh, yes, uh, I think it's obvious that you are uh, of a Caucasian ancestry. Yes. That your parents. I think one could assume that your parents were probably Protestants. What um, what uh, what made you become a Buddhist? Um, okay, I'll. Uh, do you want to? You mean this lifetime? <laughs> um, actually, I was raised Jewish, um, so I can uh, um, I can give. I can give a, a very long version, but... Um, a Protestant Jew or a Catholic Jew? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sort of secular Jew, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, my first conversion experience um, was... So I'll give a shorter version of this. Uh, my first conversion experience was uh, about a year after my bar mitzvah when I was lying on the grass looking up at the sky and somehow had this you, realization, it was a conversion, I realized that, that looking up at the sky that it was all infinite. I just felt that, I still feel that. And um, that meant to me that it, if it was that way in space, it was that way in time and the idea of a creator deity did not make sense. So I became an atheist and um, started reading things like Bertrand Russell and so forth. And, and um, 
that led me to, uh, anyway, there were various steps along the way from that, uh, led me to the Friends Service Committee and Pacifism, but also it led me into a lot of existential questioning and reading Kafka and Dostoevsky and, and looking for meaning, and that eventually led to uh, Buddhist practice. That's the short version. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, you talk a lot about the problems of the world, and what do you see are some of the solutions to those problems? I mean, you know, I can go to a, a Occupy thing and hear about all the trouble with with the American and modern corporations. I go to a peacenik rally and I hear about all the problems with war. And I go to a uh, climate change rally and they talk about and decry all the problems with nuclear power and our energy sources. Yet we're going to need power, we're going to need uh, civilization, we need goods to get the people. Where do you see as solutions to these problems? I mean, is it just a matter of protesting against it without a solution, or do you see any hope for mankind? Oh, yeah, I do see hope, of course. Um, but I don't, I don't know the solutions. I don't, I'm not, you know, um, I don't know that, I don't think anybody knows the solutions. I think keeping asking, I do believe in questioning. I think that if we keep questioning what's happening and looking at it, uh, that uh, we have a chance of finding alternatives. That, that, that to, to think that, that what's the status quo is the only possibility is very short-sighted. And I don't, you know, I, so I don't have, I, I don't have, I don't have the answer. If I, if I had the answer to world peace or to energy, I'd be, you know, I wouldn't be doing this. Um, but um, I, just because I don't have all the answers doesn't mean that right. we, that, I, that all of us shouldn't be questioning. I think part of the solution will come from lots of questioning, from lots of sides. I do believe in respectfulness and in respecting and listening to questioning from all different perspectives. So I really do believe, it's not like I'm trying to promote one perspective. I, ha I, do, have my, I do have my opinions about things and I'm willing to, spa to state them, but I think we need to listen to lots of perspectives and we need to question from lots of perspectives. And, but just to say, well, this is the way things are now, and there's no, and, and if we don't, if you don't present some other solution, then we just have to leave it the way it is. The way it is is not working. Okay. Uh, yes, Charlie. Yeah, Tegan, I, I deal with a lot of management officials as a union representative, and you want me to repress my negative emotions. Uh -oh. And with the, with the members of the union, I'm supposed to, what, respond with respectfulness to what management wants? I mean, I'll tell them. You want me to tell the members of the union this? I was responding with respectfulness. I, you know, it's not that, I, not that you should repress negative emotions, actually. So I'm glad you asked the question that way. Thank you. No, it's that one needs to really be with one's negative emotions and look at them and turn that so that you can express them more fully and more thoroughly without just, you know, combativeness and contentiousness. Because then, then you just have an argument. Can you see your negative emotions and express your opposition to what the, unit, the management is doing on behalf of your... Uh, your your workers and the people you represent in a way that they can hear it. Because if you're if you're just coming from anger, uh, then they're just going to come back at you with anger. It doesn't. It's not so helpful. You have to you have to be your anger so fully and 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 be with your anger so fully that then you can find a way that they that you can listen to them and they can hear you and and it, that may not help either. So I'm not talking about repressing emotions at all. I'm talking about kind of finding a way to express it from a deeper place. And that's not, that's hard work. It's not something you can do right, anybody can do right away. That takes a little, that takes some work. But it's about more fully expressing those negative emotions from a place where you're, where you're not just venting, you know? Does that make sense? 
All right. All right. I don't think it'll work. <laughs> 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 oh, I've got a question. Yes. Um, well, it came from India to China to Japan and evolved, and now it's different in America, but yes. part of Mahayana to get technical, but yeah, um, it just happens that on my that I met a teacher in the Upper West Side of New York when I was 25 who was a Zen Buddhist priest and he was, and it just, it was it. Oh. It just totally, that was it for me. And it still is. Well, it, yeah, and I've studied a lot of other things since and I'm very influenced by a lot of other um, uh, versions of Buddhism, versions of Buddhism and other traditions. Well, I, I know I, that uh, many of the peace demonstrations I've been in have had a uh, chance of uh, not your own. Not your own, Yeah. So, uh, I like this guys. No, it's, no, but they're they're chanting to the Lotus Sutra, which I, I take also. Uh, well. Uh, is there anything we should, we non-Buddhists should learn from this? I'd, I'm happy to respond about Buddhism. If you, uh, there, there are different varieties of Buddhism, so I'm happy to just talk about, you know, Buddhist, different, different Buddhist schools. The, the Lotus Sutra, which uh, they're chanting Nami Horendikyo, that's one branch of the Lotus Sutra schools. The ones that are chanting at the peace demonstrations, Nami Horendikyo, and hitting the drums. They're uh, one of the many Lotus Sutra schools is from Japan. Uh, and, uh, but the Lotus Sutra was also important to the founder of the branch of Zen that uh, I'm from in Japan. Dogen is his name. I've translated a lot of this stuff. And I wrote, wrote a book about his, his uh, take on the Lotus Sutra. So, so. Uh, Thomas Burke? Thomas Burke. Yes. Uh, aside from being a Trappist monk, he, uh, he died in Thailand. Uh, Tragically. Uh, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I was wondering uh, what uh, the, the relationship of uh, Christianity and Buddhism is that I've actually been involved. Or perhaps I should have you were brought up. Well, I'm also a, I've also been a professor of comparative religion, and I find something of value in every religious tradition, actually. Um, and I've, I've been, it happens I've been particularly involved in Zen Catholic and dialogue. Too. What's that? And offenses. Well, that's, yes, religion is a problem in, in, in every tradition, <laughs> so, um, yeah, but, but um, particularly about Zen and Catholicism, I've been involved in a lot of dialogue around that, and one of the interesting things, and I think we were talking about this earlier, uh, is that um, there happened to have been many Zen, uh, Catholic clergy, uh, Who've, who've done intensive uh, study of Zen meditation, and thanks to them, there is more of the Catholic mystical and meditative tradition available now than there was previously. Uh, the Desert Fathers, Meister Eckhart, uh, the Cloud of Unknown. So there's a, there are wonderful meditative traditions in the in the Western tradition too that are becoming more available. Partly because of interaction with Buddhism, so just a historical accident type of history. Other questions? Yes. Back here, I don't know your name yet. What? I don't know your name yet. Yeah, I'll stick on that. Okay, um, you talk about Sun 
something meditation where you, you are walking? Yes. So how is that? Because the only thing that I know from the meditation is like sitting down, relaxing and thinking. So how it is about like walking, meditating while you are walking? How that uh, works? Yes. Um, there, there are flyers up here about um, ancient dragon Zen gate, which is a half block down at Irving Park. We have meditation instruction every Sunday morning at 8:45. If you can't come Sunday morning, there's an email that you can send and arrange another time. But we uh, commonly, in between sitting periods of sitting meditation, we get up and do walking meditation. It's very, very, very slow walking. Um, but it's an extension of the space of sitting meditation. And there are various different walking meditation traditions in different, in different branches of Buddhism. So part of what we emphasize is to take the, and this is what I've been talking about tonight, it's to take the awareness from sitting meditation into our everyday activity in terms of responding to problems in society, in terms of responding to problems in our own everyday activity life and activities. So walking is one aspect of that. So yeah, there's a, in many Buddhist traditions, there is a tradition of walking meditation. So you can come a Sunday morning or other times if you email us, we can arrange and uh, you can learn about that. Uh, Maureen? Um, I would like to piggyback It takes a lot of work. Okay. Yeah, she asked about what what is the process of actually going into. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I haven't been repeating the questions. Um, what is the process of actually going deeper into uh, what we might call negative emotions and to transform them? This is a totally important question. Um, so, and, and anger is, you know, probably the, the, the biggest example. Um, and it's not something one can do just by hearing about it. But through the process of doing regular sitting meditation or reflection to just physically feel the, feel one's anger, to first of all forgive oneself for feeling anger, to own one's own anger, instead of blaming that person made me angry, to say, oh, this is my anger. Uh, somebody else may have given you the opportunity to feel it, but to actually feel what it feels like and it takes time, it takes a little while of being willing to, to study one's own patterns of anger and become friendly with yourself, forgive yourself for feeling that anger, and really to um, breathe into it. I mean, it's a physical thing, it's not, uh, so I'm not talking about something uh, exactly psychological, although it's related to that, um, but uh, in, in our meditative practice, it's a physical yogic practice of really feeling how it feels, where we feel in our body, getting to know our own patterns of response and, and the way we feel that anger. And we say in our precept about anger, not harboring ill will. So that means not holding on to the anger. It's not that you don't feel anger, but you let it go. When we hold on to our anger, we turn that into grudge and hatred. And so many of the world's problems are because of hatred, because we decide, I hate, you know, whoever, whatever, those kind of people, you know. Turn, hating a certain group of people doesn't help. So I don't hate the, uh, the, the fossil fuel company CEOs. I just, you know, that doesn't help. I want to stop them from doing what they're doing. But that's not because I personally hate them. I just I, I, I know that I, that's 
not helpful to them or to me. Uh, but that takes, you know, that takes really looking at one's own feeling of anger and, and admitting that you feel like or just letting it go and doing that again and again and again. And not, did not, did not repressing or denying the anger, but just, okay, there it is again, letting it go, not turning it into grudge. And, and that's a practice to actually do, just by saying that all of that doesn't, isn't going to automatically make it happen. But, if you can pay attention to it, it starts to happen. Thank, thank you for your question. Yes. Oh, drop the hill. Yeah, taking the kind of for example, there's a counterexample, but organized religions have traditionally embraced the established traditions. And there have been an opposition to change. At times, yes. And then, and more often than that, I mean, I'm reading this week opposition to the, to the gays and the Boy Scouts and things like that. Uh, now you show up and you say, well, I'm a new version of religion. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I'm uh, a little suspect of this. I'm <laughs> not going to take on the mantle of all religions. I'm talking about, you know, a uh, Western version of engaged Buddhism. And I'm not going to speak for all Western Buddhists either. <laughs> I'm talking about Chicago Buddhist Peace Fellowship. So, uh, yeah, and traditionally in Buddhism as well, as, uh, as Western religions, uh, a lot of, historically in Buddhism, a lot of how Buddhists in Asia try to make society better was by trying to, you know, influence uh, the rulers, the powers yeah. that be, to be a little, a little less harsh in their rule. And of course, we also had samurai Zen in Japan and Zen at war, and the, and the, and, and the Buddhists in Japan in the early 20th century. Most of them, unfortunately, went along with the militarism that led to World War II. So. I, I, I'm not going to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I refuse to re be a representative of all religion. <laughs> well, I've got a question. Hey, uh, does the uh, Chicago uh, Zen community support uh, uh, the social safety uh, uh, that, uh, and, uh, uh, and Absolutely. <laughs> Labor, labor disputes. Uh, well, I, I uh, yeah, uh, one of uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> do. I, I haven't, haven't we? Uh, well, I, you know, one of my um, one of the people in my congregation is a is a high school teacher and marched with the teachers union. Well, and 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 I uh, marched with uh, went to a rally. Oh, thank you so much. I went uh, to a rally of the nurses uh, uh, who were speaking for uh, what was that in the time of the NATO march. So absolutely, well, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to need one. You no, know, I, I think part of the social social justice is and part of what's going. What's one of the many issues that I think is important in. Uh, in, in the problem in our society, again, going back to the uh, the inequitable distri distribution of resources is the destruction of the middle class and the, what the banks are doing. And, you know, so absolutely, uh, we need a, 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 social, a social welfare net, uh, network and uh, fair treatment of immigrants and so forth. Yes, absolutely. To uh, follow up on that, uh, last Saturday I missed uh, uh, our Bishop uh, Sally Dick's uh, uh, meeting on the South Side, uh, which was how Methodists are supposed to change the world on issues of community safety, restorative justice, Education and literacy, uh, food deserts. Uh, are those concerns of your congregation? Yes. Oh. 
And what you're doing about it, and what should we be doing about it? You know, there's so many things to respond to that. Yes. Oh. Okay, why don't, you, why don't you tell him what I said? <laughs> <laughs> but, see, what a delicate way to put me in the spot. Oh, okay. <laughs> but he said, he said uh, and, and, and I experienced that myself, uh, not going to the Buddhist temple, but I went to a group that is called Recovery. And what I was uh, happening to me, that I was being very upset and, and, and unable to do anything, when I got uh, involved in my, I have a factory, I have workers, workers, and I couldn't get him to do what, I, what he needed to be done or whatever, and I got totally uptight and all that. And one day I went to this recovery, and there is a man, a Puerto Rican man, that works fixing the buses in the city of Chicago. And he was angry and he says, you know, when I lost my, my flashlight, they stole it from me. And, and they told him, well, you know, think about it. Uh, whoever he stole it from you, maybe you can ask him back or so on. But, but think about how you did with it. And so what he realized, he said that he left the flashlight with the magnet hanging under a somewhere in the bus, so he, ah, when is the bus coming back? So he called the bus and said, let me know when the bus comes back. He went and the flashlight was there. <laughs> that day, when he explained that, I said, if he could do it, I could do it. <laughs> and then I start channeling my anger and my, instead of being angry with a person, trying to figure a way to solve it. And that's what he was saying. Instead of, you know, express all that anger, just think about it channel it into a positive way. So if you were not here, you may have not heard, but you were here, but you didn't listen. Um, I wanted to just uh, introduce one of the priests at my uh, temple, Yozan, and one of the other priests here, uh, Asian is the director, is our director, actually works in food pantries, so that is one response. Uh, Stand up. Uh, yeah, good evening. I just, um, from where I'm sitting and hearing different questions from, coming from different directions, and I heard, um, uh, you know, uh, an expression of sort of a quite appropriate general suspicion or skepticism about um, uh, anybody who comes from a, tr some kind of a tradition of organized religion, followed by a question from you, um, sort of questioning, you know, do you in fact, um, are you actually, are people in your community actually getting out and doing things? And uh, the things that immediately came to mind is uh, Asian Nancy, for example, had a long-term involvement with uh, food pantry in Lakeview. I've been going into the prisons for five years. Jeremy has, uh, a fellow named Jeremy, has been very active in the teachers union. We have people working with, uh, in issues of, you know, in, in sort of a chaplaincy capacity, not directly related to our chapel, but working in hospice and chaplaincy and those kinds of things. So, so there's no organized program indeed, but uh, there are lots of people who are involved with many of the kinds of things that I think your question was trying to raise. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, churches or uh, religious groups are larger or smaller. We're tiny. And sometimes, <laughs> you know, uh, Half of us, well, no. <laughs> but we, you know, sometimes we can do things together yeah. as a church. I mean, my, United Church of Rogers Park uh, uh, advertises a statement uh, that we're against war uh, and uh, that we're uh, interested in, in the rights of, uh, of GLBT uh, groups and so on. Uh, uh, so, uh, and then we... That's another area that one of after school programs and so on for kids in the neighborhood. And, yeah, but we have a, a larger plant than most, most uh, small churches. <laughs> so, okay. All right, thank you. Oh, one more question. Yo, yes. Please. No, don't fight. Thank you. How do you balance contemplation? How do you balance contemplation with your social action? 
That's a wonderful question. She asked how to balance contemplation with social action. Um, yeah, that's the question that I that I you know struggle with all the time. Uh, we just came out of a two month uh, intensive practice period, and I've been mostly focusing on uh, study and practice and meditation. Um, but I keep, pay, you know, I feel like it's important to pay some attention to what's going on in the world and respond when I can. So I was very happy that President Obama is coming Wednesday. Uh, I saw, I saw uh, Bill McKibben and Sierra Club talking about actions happening around the country in July, and I wasn't able to get to any of those places, and so I'm glad that I have an opportunity this Wednesday. But um, I also recognize, have been forced to recognize that I can't do everything. It's very important to find balance. It's very important to to know that, so part of the answer is community. So none of us can do all the things we might wish to do in terms of contemplation, in terms of study, in terms of uh, social action. We can't do everything ourselves. Together, we can do many things. And it's very important also to take time for rest and recreation and just to, to find a way to keep, you know, to, to, to have a healthy, uh, full life. So uh, to have a balance. Part of what we emphasize in our meditation and uh, kind of uh, practice is a kind of sense of balance. Uh, the middle way is a, is a basic idea in Buddhism. So to find a balanced way that includes some, you know, and it's different, the balance point is different for each person. Each of us has a different range of capacity to address different kinds of uh, responses. So some people are good at certain kinds of responses and some people are good at other kinds of responses. So it's not that everybody should be going out to demonstrations at all. But find the things that you can respond to and do those. And also, you know, take time to just enjoy yourself. Uh, you mentioned uh, you can't really rely on the mainstream news. So Not at all. Just, I was just curious, like, okay, can you list four or five places that you get what you consider to be a uh, credible news source that's, that's digging into the facts? Democracy Now. Uh, it's on in the it's on in the evening on radio. It's on. I watch it at channel 19 and get that in the morning at seven o'clock. Or you can just go to democracynow.org. After that, uh, The Nation magazine, um, sometimes Huffington Post. Um, there's not so much, you know, but there's so, but it's out there if you look. Um, there are there are lots of other places on the internet, but you know, I'll just leave it there. Yes. What is your opinion of public radio? WBEZ in particular. WBEZ has good cultural things, and it's got that good program at noon. Um, and uh, I used to I used to work in TV news mm -hmm. in New York and San Francisco. I worked used to work for NBC News and ABC News and and um, and uh, PBS in New York. And uh, I don't think much of uh, the national media. You, so you don't think that. Um I, I don't. I, so I don't. I don't uh, trust NPR national news at all. I don't trust the. I don't trust uh, Fox News or CNN or the New York Times. What about? Have you watched any like Al Jazeera on, on or uh, some of the other foreign broadcasts? I, I watch. I, I occasionally I've watched Al Jazeera. I, I watch. I watch. BBC has. You know. Is. is it's better than most of most things that on this in this country. I try and limit how much I watch because I can't. You know, there's a, there's a, I can't. I used to be a news junkie. I used to work in TV news. Yeah, I mean, I re seriously. And I so I, I I have a limit to how much I can stand in it, uh, all of it. Uh, and, and I think you know to spend too much time. Anyway, so I you know I. So then, so then, what do you do for a father? Who's about 80 years old, and he's, that's all he wants to watch is Fox News. How do you get through to him? This is a question I get asked a lot. 
um, because a lot of people in my congregation have relatives, and people you know people in my family are, are fundamentalist, uh, and we listen to Rush Limbaugh, watch Fox News, and um, you know sometimes there's nothing you can do. <laughs> Uh, so, but what you know, what I would say is to listen to them and be respectful. And um, you know, if, if sometimes if you listen and you're respectful, they'll let they'll listen to you too. And that's the most you can do. And if you, but to try and persuade somebody who's who's uh, listening to Fox News full time of something that you know that they've been. You know, basically, I would call it brainwashing. You know, you can love somebody who who believes all that stuff and still relate to them personally in a loving way. But you know, to try and persuade somebody of something that you can't persuade them of, uh, I, you know, don't waste your time. And one final question for me: Who would you consider Jesus Christ to be? Gosh. Um, I don't know. I never met him. Cop out. Cop out. Cop out. I think he was a. I think he was a good, um, a good rabbi, a good moral, a good moral teacher. You know. I don't know. Other than that. I, I think there's a lot of good stuff in the gospels. You know. Why don't we go to rebuttals? Jerry, you have something to contribute. About. All right, and who's Margaret, one, two, three, anybody else? Yeah, I'll say something. Yeah. 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 How much time do we have? We're going to probably go yeah. over one. <laughs> yes. You've been scribbling there for a long time. Okay. John? No, 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 no. Speak to us. All right. Okay. Uh, who's first? Uh, okay. Who's first? About seven minutes, Frank. You guys are real accommodating. Uh, About seven minutes each. Am I second? We do have to assert our rights from time to time. About seven minutes. Oh, thank you. I want to thank Tiger and Dan for his very informative and uh, illuminating talk. Thank you very much. You should have a, a watch and um, talk some. One of the things that bothers me is that the general American ideal or idea of Buddhism resides with the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan uh, situation in western, northwestern China. Um, but if we look to that as an example of Buddhism, we, it gives us great trouble. First of all, half of the land in Tibet is owned by the Buddhist monasteries. And uh, the Buddhist monks do not work the land. The people work the land, for which they get no pay. It's a, an alms giving. And they also are required, or I shouldn't, yeah, they're required officially, uh, to, uh, to give alms to the begging monks. And that's, uh, that's uh, something that they do not quite voluntarily. Um, the rest of the land in Tibet is owned by very large landowners, and uh, the Buddhist monks uh, protect the interests of those large landowners, and uh, through the method or the, the practice of Buddhism, they discourage the general population from uh, rebelling against those landlords or even against the Buddhist monks. Um, Taigen Dan mentioned the uh, problem with nuclear energy and fossil fuels and so forth. Uh, in uh, last week's British publication, uh, New Scientist, there was a, a, an opinion article by the German environmental minister, Jogan, I've forgotten, I can't pronounce his last name. Um, it seems that we're, Germany has shut off all of its nuclear reactors no power, no electricity is generated from the nuclear reactors in Germany. And yet, Germany is now an exporter of electricity to its neighbors, particularly to France. 
which has many, many nuclear reactors. Um, there's something to be said. If Germany, a highly industrial country uh, with a great social program, even in spite of Angela Merkel, um, is able to do that, to use, they use solar, they use wind, and they use coal, coal-powered station, particularly in western Germany near the Alsace-Lorraine coal deposits. But if they can do that and also be an exporter of electricity, it seems obvious that we can do it and that the whole world can do it as well. We have to thank you, the master here, for having been always a friend of the environment, of uh, social justice, and uh, we benefit from his uh, uh, friendliness because uh, our anti-nuclear group was able to go and present there to, to the people um, and kind of trying to explain in more details what is the problem with the nuclear, the nuclear power. Uh, it's an issue that is uh, complicated, but uh, when you start trying to get into the technical details, but if you look at the consequences of uh, uh, the, the, the leftovers of the nuclear powers by their waste, products and by the waste that is uh, coming all along as the mining, the refining, the enrichment, all of those steps are steps that leave a legacy of death every step of the way. Um, it's important also to mention about Germany and France. France the pro-nuclear people, which some are here, that they are insisting that we, we have to go nuclear. I don't know where he is now. But um, the French have been exporting highly radioactive waste to Russia, where it's been left in the open in truck, in, in train loads, in big warehouses, to the open air. Uh, France is dumping radioactive waste in the waters of the ocean continuously. Um, France is releasing krypton, radioactive krypton gas into the atmosphere continuously in their reprocessing process that they are doing. And France is importing electricity for Germany as it was mentioned before. When there was a big heat wave in Europe that 35,000 people died because of the heat, the French reactors couldn't operate. Why do you think is that? Because the rivers were low. And when you have a reactor, you better have water to operate them. So they have to shut them down. And so people die not only because of the heat, but because the French couldn't provide electricity for air conditioning and so on. So that's one of the problems we confront. And about global warming, the deniers of global warming are uh, somehow ignorant, somehow maybe malicious because they might be making money about denying the, the issue, but there is no uh, scientific question anymore to ask about that by increasing the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we are producing an imbalance that end up warming the atmosphere. If you want to learn more, especially the young people, look into black body radiation, which is one of the things that makes the balance of the heat coming in and the heat coming out. Uh, to give you maybe a little example, if you have a glass of water, here we have a glass of water, and you have a little candle here, and this little candle will heat the water 
until the temperature of the water is emitting as much energy as the candle is giving. So when that temperature is reached, is reached that the temperature of this glass of water is enough to emit as much radiation as the heat that the candle is producing, then the temperature doesn't raise anymore. But now, if you increase the candle power, then the temperature will be raised. But now, let's do another experiment. Then you have the first candle, and now you put a cover over the glass. Well, the temperature is going to go higher. And that is simple as that. So what we're doing with the greenhouse gases is we are preventing the radiation in infrared to escape in the outer space. And the temperature has to go up until it reaches the point where enough radiation is going out to compensate what is coming in. So anyway, that uh, we have to not only listen more to a peaceful resolution of all this, uh, find ways to influence people without beating them in the head with a two by four, because this is what I, I want to do sometimes. And I don't think it will work because I will end up in jail or, or, or the guy have a bigger two by four. <laughs> and that will be not good for me. So anyway, thank you very much again. How long was it? Should I go there? Seven, hey, uh, seven, uh, very good, go interesting on. presentation. Uh, one of the things I got out of it that I probably wouldn't get uh, out of my own church, the Unitarian Universalist Church, or the groups I'm in, you know, it sounded like I was at church most of the time, except one interesting thing that I'm thinking about myself is, uh, a commendable uh, sense of humility uh, in what the speaker said. I, I think that's something I want to take away from this uh, talk. Uh, one or two other things on the, we talked about the news and how bad the news is. So of course, one thing you can do about the news is Come to the College of Complex. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to get different points of view, and a lot of them you will not get on the media. Uh, if you want to find out something about Germany, uh, two of the rebutters that were here before me mentioned Germany. And I, I, was, I don't have the detail they do, but I know some of that stuff, a little bit of that stuff, because I watch Channel 20 uh, Monday through Friday at 10 o'clock. They have something called the Journal. And right now, it's, they run by different countries. They have Russia, they have uh, France, they had uh, United Kingdom. Uh, right now, it's Germany. So you will hear a lot of news about Germany and, and many of the things the two last rebutters uh, mentioned were Again, without, they gave good detail that I didn't know, but some of that stuff I had heard about Germany, uh, about their uh, uh, power and the fact that they don't use nuclear power uh, and the fact, you know, a lot of their talk about technology. So if you're interested in that, you might want to at least watch the first 15 minutes from 10 till 1015, uh, Channel 20, Monday through Friday. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I was under the impression this was supposed to be a uh, talk about uh, Buddhism. Uh, it seems to me that uh, instead uh, we were told that we can go to uh, Michigan and Belvo and demonstrate against the, uh, against the uh, Keystone Pipeline that uh, the president is supposed to be um, making some kind of a decision on or something, that uh, uh, I really didn't uh, get very much on Buddhism at all. 
or if that is basically the crux of Buddhism, I uh, would have to say that I am, uh, first of all, I'm very much in favor of the uh, of the Keystone Pipeline coming through, and I think that uh, that uh, in my mind uh, it tells me that Buddhism is um, is anti-American and uh, is not only un-American but anti-American, and uh, for that reason, I um, I have to say that it just. Uh, uh, certainly doesn't fit with me at all. Thank you, Eve, very much. All right, next. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah, well, interesting stuff. And before I get into some substance of various thoughts about the political culture and activism and all, I'm going to first address, make some comments about dealing with anger. I've been studying American political culture for a good 50 years now, ever since Jack Kennedy was removed from office. And I ended up, partly out of that, becoming something of a student of charisma in Western political culture. And if you're going to go studying charisma, Kennedy is as good a place to start as any. But you would do well, especially, and I didn't know it would work out this way at the time, you would do well if you want to uh, get, get a grip on anger to study the dark side, too. And as it happened, W wasn't around yet. He would be a very good study, by the way. By my lights, he's a very underrated speaker. Okay. So I ended up studying Hitler. And what I urge, you know, one way to go about learning how to deal with anger, you pick W or Hitler or whichever one you want to pick. But you want to listen to these guys and try to, try to put yourself in the mood of their followers when you're doing it. Because these guys pushed buttons, real buttons, and they were, you know, Hitler, Hitler was, out, was all world at it. W wasn't half bad. And I can remember listening to W's speech after 9 11, and the, so the solemnity and the determination, he brought it off. Okay? And he pushed the buttons, and I got chills. I could see what, the way this guy was doing it. He was going to just wipe the floor with his opponents. He was going to run the table. And the American people were going to click their heels and fall in line. And that's what they pretty much did. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's number one to, to understand. And then if you can do that, you know, if you can get, then, then when you hear a W-ist or, or of that ilk face to face, You'll, you'll, you'll be all but inoculated, so to speak, from an anger standpoint. Okay, been there, done that. I can see what these guys are about. Now, now to move on to other aspects of all of, 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 of specific comments that you made about specific things, um, and all uh, you referred to how the, you won't get any, uh, a, a, any decent coverage about stuff like nukes, in the New York Times, that the, the, the situation is a farce. Yeah, well, um, indeed, indeed, and indeed, um, as far as I'm concerned, American political culture is, truth be told, so as the saying goes, past praying for. Past praying for. It is, it is a farce. The whole thing's a farce, and it's going to stay a farce. It's a rigged game, and you know, you, yes, yes, you can talk about how there was slavery back then, but at least. They were able to get rid of slavery with a war. All right? They were able to get rid of it. This, you've just got the elites in this country crapping all over the place. And they're doing it with virtual impunity. Yeah, 40 years ago, there were hundreds of thousands of folks in, in front of the White House. Well, I wonder how many of them, how many it's going to take of them to congregate in front of the White House now before they're arrested as terrorist suspects or some such. And when that happens, what's the media going to say? 
Now, if, if, if Nixon would have just had troops opening up on those 100,000 or so kids in front of the White House 40 years ago, the media would have had a cow. I don't think the media's going to have no cows nowadays. They've got, except maybe with the death of Nicole Brown Simpson, but 100,000 here, 100,000 there. You know, the, the, the famous quote from Uncle Joe Stalin, the death of one man is a tragedy. The death of a million is a, a statistic. Okay. And that's pretty much, I'll wager, how the media sees it nowadays. And that's a story in itself. And now to move to another one of your examples of, by your lights, the good guys, you know, winning cigarettes. Well, this, yeah, there are certain individuals, there were a bunch of individuals hooked on cigarettes back then. The society is hooked on oil now. Whole different ball game. You know, you can, if, you, if you illegalize cigarettes, smoking cigarettes now all together, there would be a bunch of folks who would have a problem, but as individuals. But the whole joint, the whole economy, the whole system is hooked on oil. No, not a remote comparison. Um, and uh, I would add, it is so much so, my guess is that long before we fry the atmosphere, assuming that there's a ways to go before we get to the tipping point, the chances are the financial system will implode for any number of reasons, starting with the fact that oil is already too damn expensive for the system to tolerate it. And the system is just papering over that fact with debt and accounting fraud. So you've just got you've got fraud and mis you know misgovernance of virtually every kind in virtually every corner of the society. And so the McKibbins of the world will end up being shown up, so to speak, by others. And as far as I'm concerned, in the light of all of this or much of this, and there's more I could say, but I assume I don't have all night. My view is that trying to change things on the national level are almost certainly futile. The odds are virtually, you know, infinity to one. And what I'm, what I do, my as, as far as I'm, the name of the game, as far as I'm concerned, is to act locally in those areas where you actually have a chance to make a sustainable difference. Now, as it happens, we live in one of the towns, by my lights, that has the best chance of surviving almost no matter what happens, aside from the obvious you know, extinction of the human race. If there's going to be any town left on the planet that has a snowball's chance of still being a town, it's going to be Chicago and Minneapolis, in my judgment, for all sorts of <laughs> geographical and what have you reasons. Um, and so... You know, my, my gig is to try to work in this town here, at least in certain segments of this town here, um, to try to preserve it from the deluge that is almost certainly coming as a result of the virtual orgy of malgovernance that we've been seeing over the past few decades. Well, my name is Gary Levitt, and I'm, these, some of these people are tough acts to follow. I have about 10 points or so, and I, they're not commandments, but I'll try to, uh, to, to be eloquent. I am sorry I haven't spoken at the college yet. I've been very shy. I took one English course in Luke College in 1970, an ultimatum from the late Dr. Harold Appel, my first therapist. Either he'd stop seeing me or I should take a course. I should have stopped seeing him. He was my first incompetent therapist. Unless you consider Dr. Dorothy Nielsen, the school psychologist at Niles North, who recommended him. I have to say, I must disagree with the professor. And I have to agree with David. Um, it wasn't about the topic of Buddhism. I'm very withdrawn. It would be nice to be an activist and to go to Washington. I'm not that uh, mobile. You know, I think I might have read The Varieties of Religious Experience by William James. But when I looked at his library, it's so thick. Uh, I didn't grow up to love reading thick books, but I think he said how deeply people feel about religion as a source to, to support it. But the thing is, why would one God allow people or tell people to be in, believe in so many different and irreconcilable religions? It doesn't seem to make sense to me. And how can you really transform anger? I did not yet read 
Uh, Carol Travers' book, Anger the Misunderstood Emotion, uh, where she says it's not as helpless people think to express it. I'm not sure about that. The brain is not a completely voluntary organ. When he talks about letting something go, I can let this pencil go easily. That's voluntary, but the brain isn't. I was sitting there wondering about what to say, and my heart rate, as I timed it, was a little over, somewhere over 100. I couldn't control it. I lost my ability to cry spontaneously. I'm glad I didn't commit suicide. But when people think of killing himself, it's not because just, oh, I, want, I thought it was going to be a, a blue sky today, I was going to go golfing. I think I'll kill myself. People are driven to it. It's bad enough that people hurt you when they know they're hurting you like robbing the bank. They're supposed to hurt people. But when people help hurt you in the name of helping you, they're murdering you and they're making you do it. If I had a client who killed a therapist who was making him think of killing himself, I wouldn't have to be a fantastic lawyer. There's two words that would be the defense. Self-defense. I've been going to Turning Point Mental Health Center for over 10 years in Skokie. It's been there for over 40 years. Ann Fisher Rainey is the CEO. You know, I saw her in the parking lot, and you know what she said? She was glad to see me. But I bet if I made an unannounced try to see her, why she threatened to sue someone who had a TV show on cable about mental health issues, because you know what he was going to say? Sit down. Sit down. Don't, don't get the smelling salts ready. Turning Point, the threshold, should work together. I left a message. Why did you think of suing him? Laura Gerber, who was the former assistant CEO, CEO, the assistant clinical director, didn't want to talk about it. I was led away by the police in handcuffs because they thought I was going to be violent. I wasn't. Now, the police officer was very polite. He kept saying, please, please, please. Now, normally when you say please, the other person has the power, but I was in some kind of handcuff. He must have thought I was much more on his heels. I would call him an asshole, but I don't want to be derogatory to a part of his body that works much better than his brain does. <laughs> um, you, you think a major catastrophe wouldn't be reported in the New York Times? Our friend, our neighbor, when they were getting it on a Sunday, gave it to us when they were done. I have trouble keeping up with reading the Tribune. I think that paper is very good, I must say. They would not report on a major catastrophe. I think they have a lot of news that they think is fit to print. I don't know what their motto is. But for some reason, they don't have a horoscope column. I'm not sure there's much support for horoscopy. The, the Sun Times has two columns. The Trib has one. Does that mean the people who read the Sun Times are twice as stupid as the people who read the Tribune? But that's another way. The Golden Holocaust is a book that was spoken about on book TV. You wouldn't believe what this professor of the history of science said about the machinations of the cigarette companies. You get some kind of radiation or something. It would be very nice if they tested it ahead of time and said, well, a lot of mice, they started coughing and some of them got lung cancer. I'm not sure this is going to happen. And um, there's, it would be nice if they could list the, the, the harmful things and the neutral things. Well, this is sort of, you know, I'm trying to be, no, things are not random. There's something called karma. I'm no scholar and I didn't do my homework. I'm not sure what karma is. The world is sometimes a dangerous place. There are these acts of God, which I think should not be called that, because learned people do not agree about the existence of God. And you know, Pat Robertson said God is punishing people with some of the bad weather. I don't believe that. I'm not sure you made any progress going from Jewish to any religion. I wouldn't have wanted to be born to any family but Jewish. They're in a way superior. In this, in this, in this sense. They're so small in number, and they've made the disproportionate contribution to the world, such as the Nobel Prizes. And they, even if you keep the name Jewish, although you're going to practice it, uh, it's, it's some weight against anti-Semitism. Now, with all due respect to Norman Finkelstein, who was kicked out of DePaul for his outspoken criticism of Israel's treatment of Palestine, with all due respect, if he made a book about the history of anti-Semitism versus the history of anti-Palestinianism, I bet there would be a measurable difference in favor of the weight of the book of the history of anti-Semitism. I think I'm a member of a minority that's very threatened, gifted and emotionally hurt. It's not in the DSM-4, and it's probably not going to be in the Diagnosis and Statistical Manual of Mental Problems 5. Dr. Earl Sullivan, my first psychiatrist, who was said by Dr. Bell to be as good as they come in the Chicago area, who I saw in 1969 to 1971, four months of hospitalization, Illinois Masonic in 69, three and 71, for one month in Grant, two months in Masonic, a woman at Grant said I was delightful. 
What did I say that was so good? I hope it was after I said something dumb. I was very obsessed with health. A sign of being uncomfortable on people was wanting to avoid cigarette smoke and being threatened by that. It was not understood. I couldn't get my sister and mother to stop. I hope it was after I said something stupid. I, I talked about her weight being a bit heavier than it should be. You know what she said? She can still function. Thank God she, she realized I didn't know what I was saying to a woman. <laughs> so I went to the recovery organization. Some gentleman mentioned that for a while. They want you to follow the ideas of Dr. Abraham Lowe, who I think is like a Pied Piper. Uh, Dr. Solon said, people do better when they go to recovery. Well, the thing is this. You have to have certain terminology. You, you can't talk about sex or drugs. And I think, as his late, late his secretary, Ms. Fries, said, be a you should just be average. Dr. Solon was the chairman of the department. Dr. Appel said he would call him all in the morning, being tired at night, so study. He wasn't average. So, this touches on smoking, it in order of their coming up. It touches on anger, it touches on the New York Times, it touches on activism with the religious experience. And uh, I hope this, maybe someday I'll, I'll talk about something. David Ramsey Steele last week sort of stole my thunder. He talked about the history of psychoanalysis. I could talk about that from the perspective of a, a victim and a survivor rather than you know, an academic. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. As a, as a stickler for accuracy and details, Timothy, how long did it take? Seven minutes, 57 seconds. Seven minutes, 57 seconds. Maybe I get the prize for getting the closest. No, I was over it. That's all right. Hello. Okay, you're next. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you. Um, I'm new here. My name is uh, John Gingrich. I'd like to tell the story about one man's experience. The man is named Bruce Damer. He's alive today, and he archives um, the history of computers. Um, so anyway, this man is a, he's wired in the brain a little differently than most people. He's able to close his eyes and then all of a sudden have visions, like spiritual visions. So uh, I'm going to uh, tell a story of one of his visions. So he closed his eyes and then he said that he met, uh, he called it the Madre. It was Mother Earth. He met um, nature, not just one tree or one plant, but spanning the entire earth. So. He said, he asked Mother Nature, um, is it bad that we're destroying your planet? Is it bad that we're like hurting you in all these ways? And she said, yes, but it's also a good thing that humans exist because they're, um, they're uh, like sending me into space. So her goal that she told this man Bruce Damer was, my ultimate goal is to move beyond this planet. Uh, beyond Earth and to other uh, planets and solar systems. So we've ar already begun doing that. Um, in the, the Mars rovers, there's like bacteria that, um, that we have like inadvertently left there. Like we didn't mean to do that, but we are spreading like natural, like nature throughout the universe. And she, li she liked that. And um, so also that leads me to something else like through the uh, ecological destruction of the planet, we are hurting uh, primarily our our race, humanity, and um, like so many other countless species and ecosystems. But just as the uh, the dinosaurs got destroyed by the asteroid, the asteroid wiped them out, but the Earth still remains. So even if we happen to wipe ourselves out, um, which please uh, <laughs> don't let that happen. But if we did, the Earth would still be here for millions of years to come. So that kind of makes me a little more hopeful. Thank you. Since I'm getting old, you've heard this before. Did you like coming? <laughs> Um, first of all, um, I think just as um, in, in sociology and, and just looking at things, you see that organized religion, its real purpose is to be a conservative force in society and support whatever the status quo is. So you can really see that in this country with the uh, Christians 
um, supporting um, homophobia and misogyny, um, which is kind of the, the social construct that, that most of the people in this country have. But I think even with the conservative forces, religion has to make a place for people who actually want to do something that um, is in opposition to the uh, to the abuses of religion. And all, all of the all of the religions have those pathways, and it was kind of funny to see the sort of pissing contest between Brahm and uh, Tygen about the uh, do you have this? Do you have that? We have this. We have that. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, um, the uh, I, uh, and the other thing about Buddhism that's very interesting is I remember George Carlin saying, you know, that uh, he said, you know, we have these demonstrations. He said, but those Buddhists really knew how to have demonstrations. When they demonstrated against the Vietnam War, they set themselves on fire. And that is a real demonstration of where your, um, where your values are, that you're willing to make that kind of a statement, which I must say I am not. So I guess um, that, that it's, it's not the religion, it, it may be the kind of viewpoint the religion gives you, but it's really not the religion, it's that people have an innate sense of what is justice and, um, and, and what is um, good and decent ways of treating other people regardless of their religion or lack of religion. And that whether you're an atheist or a Jew or a Christian or a Buddhist or a Muslim, you have that, you have, con you have innate concepts of what are the right things to do that have really nothing to do with the religion that you're a part of. And it's important to act on those. And uh, for me, it was important to know that I didn't need the uh, religious nonsense that the Catholic Church tried to pound into me. So, um, and it was, at any rate, so it, it, it's, it's the good people, regardless of where they come from, who do the kinds of things that are important. And um, it's the bad people who use religion as a, a, a rationale for doing really, really nasty, evil things. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here we go again with the parade of problems that we're having in the world. Here we go again with the bashing of America, the bashing of the oil companies, the bashing of the corporations, the bashing of the city government, the bashing of, an, of all kinds of institutions, when in effect, what I think you're really upset about is just the way the world has been going. Personally, I see hope. Personally, I see a lot of good things happening in the world today. Did you realize that over the last 30 years there's been a real quiet revolution going on in the world of communications? It's been less than 30 years since we've had these big monster machines that now can fit inside the palm of your hand in the form of a smartphone. It has been less than 30 years when people are almost instantaneously able to communicate with one another through social media. And it has been less than 30 years and the short problems with my own lifetime that I'm beginning to feel a little out of sync with society. The mere fact that I can get this up on a website and out to the world within hours after going home tells you something of the power of innovation, of what people can do when they accomplish a goal together. Namely, a lot of people in Silicon Valley have brought themselves together in the form of uh, capitalistic enterprises. They succeed and they fail, 
and they're allowed to fail, and some cash out big, some cash out small. That's the power of innovation. And if you look at our climate change today, if you were to walk into any city 100 years ago, you would see today's cities much, much cleaner. Back then we had horse manure, we had mud, we had many other social problems that were due to the lack of cleanliness, but because of the introduction of plumbing, of electric power, of sewers, of basic sanitation, we've been able to clean up our world. Now there's a lot of these lacking in a lot of foreign countries today, but it's starting to come finally into the developing world. One of the most fundamental things that I think causes societal change is just the availability of electric power. And yet you environmentalists will want to do everything that's done conventionally to be against it. Yes, I'm a supporter of climate change. I believe that the climate we need to get off oil. I believe that we need to do things in here, but where is the new source of power coming from? I don't agree with the present forms of nuclear power, neither did I or a gentleman by the name of Alvin Weinberg, who also invented the current reactor that we use today. He was actually fired from the Nixon administration for denouncing his very invention. And he came up with an alternative. That alternative, as you probably have heard me speak about today, is something called the liquid fluoride thorium reactor, which I believe will power society for the next thousand years. Yes, there's some radiation danger. Yes, there's some things, but the amount of waste that's produced is by far smaller in comparison to what goes on today. That's just one solution to perhaps maybe a problem that we're having with climate change. But yet, at the same time, you'll find that some of our nuclear activists who are just now starting to learn about it are still demonstrating against it without looking fully at the evidence. The second thing that I want to tell you about is there is a lot of power with the modern corporation and the modern capitalist system. For me, the invention of the corporate revenue bond was surely revolutionary to bring about social change because it provided a means of, of people to get together to do large projects. And yes, Wall Street is an evil institution at some point when you have a monopolistic power. We don't have capitalism in that respect. What we have is the very thing that Adam Smith railed against called, called the corporatism, or as he likes to put it, mercantilism. For me, the one thing we need to do is very simple. Get the rule of law back in working around the world. Get some kind of standards and world governance moving forward. Get the communications open and people talking a little bit more. And by all means, let people innovate. It is by the power of innovation that problems are solved. It is by the power of innovation and change that these people who want to do things, do things. Perhaps I might be wrong about the thorium nuclear power reactor, and I'll admit, if there's a better alternative, I'll be more than happy to, to find it. But I will say, the one thing you do not want to shut down is the power of innovation. And the only way that I can really see that happening is through the modern capitalistic system, where companies are allowed to build, to fail, to succeed, to go bankrupt, and the best idea comes and rises to the top. Sometimes the best thing an entrenched company needs is a little stifling competition. I'll close with this one quote by uh, a gentleman who invented modern television. And his name was Sarnoff. And he said, uh, competition produces the best in products, but a lot of times brings out the worst in people. Hopefully, through the power of collaboration, innovation, and yes, competition, I believe we're all in for a much better world. And yes, through the power of innovation, I believe that our O'Doyle addiction will be broken. You need the patience of Buddha to listen to this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> serious. It's just innovation. Innovation, Charlie. Innovation. It's a much better world for the um, 
to people who are enslaved in Asia making your telephone gadgets. <laughs> it's a really a much better world for them. There's certainly know. a lot better world. You know, look at that when you see Every like time you take that out, why don't you ask yourself the age of the child who made it? <laughs> Was it an eight-year-old or a ten-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you take it out? How, how old was the child that made that? Telephone ears. <laughs> um, an announcement. Um, since we're talking about the environmental thing, if, if you want to become a presenter and go through training you the Climate Reality Project of Al Gore, there's going to be training this in, in Chicago this summer, mm -hmm. July 30th to August the 1st. Uh, and you get trained how to be a presenter and they give you a PowerPoint. We may have them here. Mm -hmm. I've been to it. It's about $750, they say, the course. It's free. You do have to make an application and get accepted. Um, but if you go to the, contact me, I can get you the info on it. But the deadline for submitting an application is June 15th. I took it, I've been through the course, and it's pretty informative. But um, anyhow, since we're now we're living in a much better world. And we are. And yeah, let's have some more radioactivity. I think you missed the point where he said this radioactivity is made Tokyo uninhabitable, but you might have missed that. I did, I did miss it. President I Orm said that. just kind of flew past you, I guess. No. <laughs> oh, it, just, it can be done in a much safer manner. But I'm going to get back. All right, I'm the fool. Um, all right, let's pick on the, Jew, the Judeo Christian tradition. Uh, incorporates absolutely nothing regarding the environment. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, in the, the, the theology of the Judeo-Christian traditions, uh, mankind is put out of the Garden of Eden into a lesser desirable world. So you begin in a negative situation. Uh, there's no commandment uh, about doing anything regarding the earth. It is it's totally absent on it, and that's why uh, there's no concern about it from the religions, those, at least those, those traditions. Um, Native Americans have a different perspective. Uh, their great spirit created the very best of all possible worlds, and and then put people on it. So they inherited the best world. They inherited actually a Garden of Eden. Uh, and that's why they have the, a bit more different perspective on it. I, it's a little hard to figure out. And I, will, I love the Native Americans studying them for years, but I, I have some difficulty comprehending a lot of their woo-woo. But uh, they're really not too solid on the dogma, but they have a different perspective. Uh, such as when they kill animals, they feel that they did something wrong. They have ways of, it, it was considered a sin and things like that. Uh, another thing regarding religions, if you want to, in the college here we used to have witches here on Halloween for many, many years, earth-based religions, and they were claiming to be the environmental religion. Um, as, and that's why they termed it earth-based religions. Um, you know, um, now, it's, it's valid and it, it's very in consonance that to hear Buddhism, a Buddhist uh, on environmental perspective because the Asians have a much different perspective towards the earth. I mean, uh, they believe there's energy in the earth and I won't get into this the landscapes and the gardens and things of that nature. They have a different perspective that many Western people simply can't comprehend. Uh, unfortunately, among those are people who want to put in pipelines. Yeah, they, don't, they don't look upon it quite as the Asians do. So I mean, they get energy from the earth and 
I see it doing my neighbor's doing the exercises and gathering this and they believe there's forces and things of that nature. And there I come, nature is a common theme in the poetry and literature and things of that nature. So it's not surprising that Buddhists would have a little different approach here. I, I do think the Buddhists, however, are really way off when it comes to being a union negotiator. <laughs> and if you think any of this stuff is going to work <laughs> with the evil people <laughs> that I am confronted with across the table when I negotiate contracts, I mean, this is, I, this isn't even, this ain't gonna make it. Nor is the membership likely to comprehend, you know, various things of this nature. So, dealing with an adversarial party who, I, they don't really, I try to penetrate, their, I mean, they sold their soul. <laughs> um, but anyhow, uh, that's where I think your tradition might uh, work. But anyhow, thank you. I enjoyed it very much and hope to see you again. Thank you. Speaker gets the last word. Just one thing, please. I remember, Tim, don't just mention David Sarnoff. Don't forget Philo Farnsworth. That's right. The stage is yours. <laughs> I think it was Philo T. Farnsworth who made the comment anyway. <laughs> oh, please. More, 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 more. More. Encore. We got a lot of time. Yeah, I unburdened myself of, a, of, of something about Shorty Spiro. He went to the University of Chicago and he joined the Student Peace Union back in 63. Uh, well, the same year you did. And, and uh, Shorty, uh, I think he may have joined a little earlier actually. Uh, because the Student Peace Union was pretty strong here in Chicago, especially around the University of Chicago. And uh, the uh, SPU uh, was the voice of uh, student opposition to nuclear weapons tests and to, uh, to the Vietnam War, which at that point uh, back in uh, all the early 60s, 59 to 60, was, uh, was just being sort of envisioned. We had advisors in Vietnam, uh, advisors, uh, military advisors. And, uh, but we didn't have hundreds of thousands of troops. Uh, and we weren't bombing uh, Hanoi, or uh, that, uh, 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 the uh, little villages all over uh, the uh, Mekong, uh, which happened, of course, under LBJ, who, uh, as a, a politician, was uh, making a war on poverty and uh, also. Uh, defending the right of uh, black Americans uh, to have rights, voting rights, which uh, lost uh, the South to the Democratic Party. Uh, and he, he was a man with a conscience, a heart and a conscience, uh, as well as being a rather tricky politician. Uh, but anyway, uh, Shorty Spiro uh, introduced me uh, to uh, the, uh, what was the predominantly, uh, the predominant uh, war peace uh, tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. I had also been introduced, uh, as he was, uh, to Dorothy Day and uh, the Catholic Worker, uh, which was a more pacifist uh, tradition. Uh, he knew both, and uh, he was uh, he became a conscientious objector personally uh, 
without uh, saying that he was a, an absolute pacifist. Uh, uh, he, uh, w what uh, the uh, Roman Catholic uh, Magisterium did not like was that he thought that just war theory uh, justified his conscientious objection. And uh, when it comes to religious theory, uh, very often the, uh, the powers that be in any society, whether it's a uh, predominantly Buddhist or, or Roman Catholic or Protestant or Jewish society, will uphold what is good for the powers that be in that society. And you got to understand that you have to work with people to transform society. God is working to transform society and we have to work with that power the power of life, if we're going to be real living persons. And that's what I see in Jesus, the wow. real living person, okay? Yeah. And I, I think if you look, uh, you will find that in him and uh, to some extent, and all the saints, uh, whether, whether they're called the Bodhi, Bodhisattva, uh, or, or saints. Uh, okay, I say. We have an open mic. Now, this is ridiculous. Our, <laughs> does the speaker get the last word, or are we? Our, our son of they didn't get your name. Oh. Go ahead. You got, you got up to seven minutes, sir. I hope you're a good American. Please. It won't take me seven minutes. I simply want to say that I think some of the misunderstanding here is that we all have, almost all of us here, have Western backgrounds and we make a quick connection between religion and belief. But Eastern religions aren't founded on belief. They're founded on a particular practice, such as meditation. So if we start attacking Eastern religions because of their belief, we're missing the whole point. Okay. We still have an open mic. All right, so work, work, work. Nature, nature pours an open mic, a vacuum yes. at the mic. You get the last word, but sir. Oh, you, good. You have plenty of time. You have plenty of time. Are you good, America? Oh, good. I, I've got another half hour, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think I might need it after all of that. Um, gosh, that was wonderful. Thank you all. I appreciated everything. Um, um, well, first of all, to, there were a couple people who thought that this was going to be a talk on Buddhism. So I'm sorry, actually. Was there a misprint or something? Yeah, no. What it says in this is that it's a talk on Buddhist Peace Fellowship, socially engaged Buddhism, program will focus on what the Buddhist practice and teaching traditions have to offer oh. contemporary social, social activists and progressives in how to sustain and develop effective approaches to social change. So Yeah, you stuck to the topic. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so, but I'd, actually, I'd be, um, and I want to, uh, don't, uh, please, uh, wait a second, the fellow who's just leaving, please don't, because I wanted, I have something I wanted to say. He, wa he was coming back. Okay. Because um, <laughs> I really wanted to respond to what you said, along with lots of other people. Well, I know, I just took one. Um, Maybe he okay. can hold it um, So anyway, I, I, for, the fellow, for the people who wanted to hear just about Buddhism and not about Buddhism and, and, and a response to social change, I'd be happy to spend the next, you know, well, after I finish talking just about Buddhism, because that's what I usually do. And, and I actually, you know, so Buddhism is not, so this is just a tiny bit, this is one piece of that, and I'm happy to respond to questions or just talk generally about Buddhism. That's, so that's one thing. Um, 
boy, there were a whole lot of really diverse stuff that people said, and that was really <laughs> cool. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I I believe in innovation and hope, and you know, and I mm -hmm. I'm not sure where, you know, I think we need to. Part of what I was trying to talk about was that we need to not give up and respond with hope, and I think that we all have different places, and I, I really like what you said about acting locally, and maybe, you know, maybe in some ways it's too late to, to avert what you talked about, so I wanted to, and since you referred to John F. Kennedy uh, and looking at the dark side and so forth, you, you probably know the book JFK and the Unspeakable by James Douglas. Oh my gosh, then read that. Doug, James Douglas, two S's. Um, he's a, he's a, uh, somebody who's just talking about Catholic workers. He's a good Catholic worker. And that, it, read that book and it'll change your view of the last 50 years and, and talk about the dark side. But also he talks about hope. Um, so it's about the people who killed uh, Jack Kennedy and why. Jack Kennedy was about, when he came back from Dallas, was going to withdraw the troops from Vietnam. He was working with Khrushchev to end the Cold War. Uh, I remember Jack Kennedy, but I you know, was too young to be, I'd forgotten because of all the focus on his womenizing and everything, I'd forgotten what a, what a really brave man he was. And he, was, he hadn't, hadn't had his chance to do that yet. So read that book, um, JFK and the Unspeakable. Okay, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I don't disagree with what you said. I don't completely agree with it either, because I don't know how, I don't know. We don't know where the innovation is going to come from. We don't know the source of the hope. Uh, you know, technology has its place. Technology also has its dangers. Um, speaking of nuclear waste, um, the point I was talking about, Joe, we were talking about that. Uh, one of the things that people don't seem to have heard is that the United States, and I was talking about nuclear, the dangers of nuclear power, and I don't know about the, the thorium nuclear liquid fluoride. Liquid fluoride thorium reactor. Take a good yeah. look at it. It gives you a lot of neat More stuff. Now. Okay, well, I, I, you know, I tend to be, because of the issue of nuclear waste. This reactor burns it up. Oh, well, I, I, I've heard that before, and, I, and I'm skeptical, but, I, but I'll look at it. Okay. But uh, one of the things that people should know is that... Uh, it's dangerous. What? Nuclear waste. Nuclear waste is more than dangerous, and it's been a problem since nuclear power has been started. But the U.S. Senate, and people may not know this, has a bill in front of it right now to make a a national nuclear waste repository. They tried it in Yucca Mountain in, in Nevada because of the earthquake faults. And nuclear, they do not know what to do with nuclear waste. And we keep creating more of it. It's dangerous for, I was talking about long ranges of 100, time. 100,000 years. 100,000 years. Whoever is going to be, I, you know, a uh, young fellow was talking about the earth surviving uh, that long. And of course, the earth will survive whether or not human beings do. But uh, whoever is around then, how will they know? How will we? Uh, so anyway, the nuclear waste is a huge topic. But the U.S. Senate right now is proposing a national nuclear waste dump. You know where it's going to be? Illinois. <laughs> so please call. Uh, Senator Durbin, or write to him. I don't. No, it's not just that I don't want it in my backyard. It's that I think it's a very bad idea transporting all that nuclear waste and, and putting it all together in some place where they don't know how to take care of it. And one of the things about nuclear waste and nuclear power in general is that all of the the nuclear regulatory commi uh, committee and all all of the regulation, so-called regulation for nuclear. Power in nuclear waste is a fraud. Okay, um, that's it's it's unsafe. Okay, that's one thing. There were so many things that were brought up, um, and all of it was interesting. Um, and I wanted to respond to a couple of them specifically, but then I wanted to talk about Buddhism. Uh, but let me see first. Oh, uh, yeah, you mentioned about Tibet, and um, your description of Tibet was true before the Chinese took over. 
Uh, so you weren't talking about current Tibet. You were talking about historical Tibet. And that's uh, and what you described about the monasteries ruling and the situation of the people there was the situation, the traditional situation before the Chinese took over. Um, the situation, so, you know, it's, this is a complicated situation, but I, but I know that, the, that under Chinese rule, the Tibetan people don't like it, and um, they've, they've sort of China has turned Tibet into, so I kind of sympathize with the Tibetan people and with the, with the Dalai Lama, and at the same time, I know it's a complicated situation, and I don't disagree with what you said about, completely about what you said, but the Dalai Lama also has criticized the traditional way that things were into that back then. So just a little footnote to what you said. Uh, right now, the Chinese are turning to the Tibetan plateau into a, uh, a waste repository, nuclear and otherwise. And, and, and so anyway, it's, it's a tragedy what's happening to Tibet. Uh, the self-immolation, the Tibetan immolations, uh, self-immolations are just one manifestation of that. Um, and, you know, we could, uh, I respect that you, uh, the fellow who is for the Keystone XL pipeline, we could have a long discussion about that, but maybe there are other things to talk about now. Um, again, I, ref I, you know, what you said about the dark side and oil and, and how, how deep that addiction is in our society, I also, I hear you. Um, I did, let's see, there were a couple of other specific little things I wanted to say, talk about. Mostly I wanted to talk about, about earth-based religions and Buddhism. <clears throat> I'll just say one thing about the human brain, though, and I appreciated and, and respected the pain you've been through, and I sympathize. Thank you. Um, just as a bit of information, though, um, science has shown that the brain is actually malleable that um, there, there's been experiments that document, for example, that uh, meditative, uh, long-term meditative experience actually physiologically changes the brain. And they've mapped where in the brain creativity happens and how that increases. So it's, so... Um, there's a plasticity. There's a plasticity, exactly. Yes, right, good. That's, I just wanted to say that. Okay, um, so in whatever time we decide to, can, to take now, I wanted to say a little bit about Buddhism, and maybe the best way is to, <coughs> excuse me, um, make some more. Um, if there's anybody you can bring me some more water, I'd appreciate it. Um, but, um, just about, so I, oh, I, and also I appreciated what you said about being tough in your, in fighting for, for workers' rights, and that's certainly something that's needed right now, so uh, please um, do, uh, by, by, by taking care of your anger and respecting your adversary across the table in those negotiations, I did not mean for you to, to back down in terms of fighting for workers' rights, okay? Thank you, sir. Um, so, um, you know, you also made some remarks about about religion and earth-based religion. So, uh, about Buddhism and its relationship to indigenous religions and its relationship to the earth. You know, I there there's it's too easy to make kind of generalizations and stereotypes comparing Western and Eastern religion. It's it's you know it's it's because <clears throat> most stereotypes, there are exceptions and so forth. However, I'm about to do that. Um, is it like the yes, Indian? Is it like the Indian? Well, there are, there's a there's a variety. I mean, Native American peoples also did, you know, deforested uh, yeah. parts of parts of Native uh, parts of America. So it's not it's not a totally simple thing. And yet, in general, indigenous peoples are. Uh, uh, connected with the earth and respect the earth and the Abrahamic religions tend to be um, 
involved in dominion over the earth and that attitude. Sometimes they represent good stewardship over the earth. So it's not totally simple, but in terms of Buddhism, um, one of the signature uh, images, when the, when the Buddha, the night the Buddha awakened and had his great awakening, he was challenged, he, he decided to just sit under the Bodhi tree of kind of fig tree until he solved the problem of suffering. And he saw how, how suffering is caused. And he was challenged by Mara, which is not really like the devil, but the spirit of temptation. And the final one was, well, who are you to be the Buddha? And there's the, the, the famous image of the historical Buddha. There are many, many, many Buddhas in, the, in various uh, pantheons of Buddhism. But it, what is he, he was sitting cross-legged, touching the earth. And the story is that the earth itself, or sometimes an earth goddess, arose and witnessed, witnessed and said, yes, you are an awakened one. <clears throat> so a Buddha just means an awake one, so an awakened one. It doesn't mean, uh, it's not, uh, it just means someone is awake. And the earth itself witnessed to that. So there's a deep connection in lots and lots of Buddhist lore to the earth itself. And the basic practice of sitting cross-legged on the ground, I mean, now in our meditation hall, we have people sitting in chairs as well, you know, and it's possible to do the meditation sitting in chairs, but there's this sense of groundedness and connection to the earth. So, you know, what you said is really important, that there's this kind of sense of connection to the earth. So that's just one thing. So I, there's so many different schools of Buddhism. I'm happy to talk about Buddhist teachings and different Buddhist schools. And I just want to throw this open for discussion and questions. Do you have the school of Buddha driving? I mean, I find myself in my best Zen-like state when I wake up in the morning, get my first cup of coffee leaving McDonald's, fire up that first cigarette and I got an open road ahead of me and no schmucks trying to slow me down. That to me is like one next step to heaven on my morning commute. Well, I'll say about that, leaving aside the McDonald's and the cigarette, that one of the things about driving is that is very much like meditation is that when you're driving, you're not thinking about, okay, do I turn left, right, do I put my foot on the brake, gas, you know, it's something that happens that you, that you know in your body how to do. So part of what is, part of what is important that we learn in meditative practice is that how we know things is not just a function of linear mind. That we know things with our body. That we know in many ways. So I, you know, one example, I can reach into my pocket now and I can feel with my fingers I know the difference between the pens and the coins in my pocket, for example. We know things not just based on, you know, defining things and thinking them through linearly. That kind of discriminating consciousness is useful, of course, but there's other ways of knowing. Sort of so, like the car becomes part of your body in a sense. Yeah, so how we, so, you know, you don't have to, yeah, so it's actually kind of amazing if you're driving on the freeway or on Lakeshore or whatever, you know, here are these big pieces of steel very heavy big pieces of steel, driving at very fast speeds, and somehow, most of the time, you manage to drive along next to other big pieces of steel, also driving very fast, and, you know, not, and get where you're going without, you know, huge crashes. That's amazing. Americans are trained to be very skillful at doing that activity. <laughs> it's it's kind, of, kind of amazing that anybody gets anywhere on a, on a freeway without huge crashes, you know. So there are things that we know that we don't, that, you know, you don't have to think about it. So that's, that's that, so, so that example, again, it's forgetting about the McDonald's and the cigarettes. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. If he were alive today, would Buddha, as I understand it, say the problem is wanting things? Now, he, ah. he wouldn't want to have a lot of materialism in his life. He probably wouldn't want a racing car. He would prefer a nice seat on a train next to Charles. 
So how yeah. much would he be? How much would he want? I like a nice hi-fi system. That's my. I got that from my dad, along with the love of. Thank goodness he he didn't love rock and roll music. I think I might be deaf by now. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, very good question. He, he uh, did you hear the question he asked about? Is, this is the, this is a basic issue: desire. So the, in terms of the cause of suffering, and there's a there's a twelve-fold chain of causation. Um, there are various steps that, that, that lead to suffering in terms of the Buddhist diagnosis of suffering. Uh, and this goes, this is, has nothing to do with the whole social engagement issue, it's just basic <clears throat> how, we, how we function. The, oh, so I, I could talk about the Four Noble Truths. This is a basic early Buddhist teaching. First truth is that there is suffering, and actually, uh, suffering is a, a little bit of a mistranslation. It really, it, the word dukkha really, the etymology of it means a wheel that's out of alignment. So it's, it means, you know, you could translate it as dissatisfactoriness or misalignment. Things are a little bit out of line. Lack of harmony? Or Lack of harmony. You know, we could say, you know, I mean, I, in terms of what I was talking about before, maybe they're way out of line. But, you know, and it does cause suffering. But Some anyway. Some kind of friction that we could avoid. Friction. Yeah, so it doesn't mean, so, so the second noble truth is that there's a cause of that. Yeah. What I was talking about before, that it's not random. That there is a cause for things. Um, that's just referring to karma, uh, and uh, and the cause of the cause of suffering is well desire, but more than that, the grasping after objects of desire. So wanting to have more and bigger and better cars and so forth. <clears throat> and um, and our society, our consumerist society, trains us to be well trains us to want more and more and more. So material society, so what you were talking about before, about um, you know, needing more and more and more instead of, you know, and, and the uh, mis, you know, the, the way that this is not a properly regulated capitalist society, but a kind of out of control uh, um, society, you know, where, where people think, where if, you, if you actually believed all the television commercials that, that, that you, you need to have all those things to be happy. We need to have everything yourself. And you, yeah, you need to get rid of all the things that make you unhappy. That's leads. That's the cause of suffering. Out with the old, in with the new. Yes. So, and the, the third noble truth is that there's an end to suffering. It doesn't mean there's an end to old age, sickness, and death. It means there's an end to our anxiety about all this. The fourth noble truth is the eightfold path. Things like right livelihood, right speech, right upright speech, right. Uh, action anyway. So the path, the the way of living. But uh, go, so going back to your your very important question, the 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 cause of suffering has to do with desire. Now some Buddh some schools of Buddhism, more in the South Asia, the Theravada schools, try and expunge desire. And contentment is a very important value. So to to want less, that's it leads to happiness. But you know, to actually try and get rid of all desires is, is not humanly, for most of us, possible. So the point is to know what you want, to know your desires, and to not act, and to know them so well that you don't act on them in ways that are harmful. So that you don't rape or so you don't steal things from others or harm others in, the, in, in terms of trying to get your own. Your, you know. I once heard a lecture by Peter Walsh at Old Orchard, who's Oprah's organizational expert. And a lady who books him, and this is before he was famous, heard about my story of not having money, much money. She gave me a free copy of his book. I have no idea where I put it. Now, the thing is, I'm sometimes wondering if he believes in a life after death. Because if someone believes in a life after death, they shouldn't get too attached to possessions, because the best is yet to come. But does Buddhism believe in heaven, that the best is yet to come? There's nirvana, or is that heaven? <coughs> oh, OK. Nirvana and heaven on two separate questions. In earlier, the earlier form of Buddhism, which is the Buddhism of South Asia now, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, Burma, Sri Lanka, called Theravada Buddhism, the Buddhism of the elders, Nirvana was defined as basically escape from the wheel of life and death, escape from rebirth, escape from the rat race, escape from this whole round of suffering. Um, 
in the Mahayana Buddhism, of the, which is the Buddhism of Tibet, China, Mongolia, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, including Zen, including Thurland Buddhism, uh, Nirvana is understood as not, this is the, the Buddhism of the Bodhisattva, the enlightened being who remains in the world for the sake of all the other suffering beings. So this is the context that I'm coming from. Uh, nirvana is not about escaping from the phenomenal world, but finding a way to be upright and helpful right in the middle of it. So there's two basic different, defi different definitions for nirvana. Now heaven, afterlife, heaven is, so in, rebirth is a huge question, and I'm not, you know, there's lots of different, different responses to that, and I won't go there. But heaven is one of the six realms. There are six realms of being, that people can be reborn in according to classical Buddhism or that we could all be in. So basically we're human beings now, okay? Most of us in this room are pretty much human beings. Uh, uh, the other realms, and this goes back to your question about desire, the other realms are heavenly realm, uh, uh, kind of ambitious titan realm like Donald Trump or somebody, um, then animal realm, uh, hell realms, and hungry ghost realm, which is unfortunate. These are beings who, who are insatiable, and so, some of the people across the table from you, uh, who um, want, who, who are never satisfied, who want more and more and more. They're depicted in the pictures as having tiny throats, big bellies, and they, they're never satisfied. Water looks like pus to them. It's really kind of gross. Uh, and our society, by being as a consumer society, trains us to be hungry ghosts. We're never satisfied. So this the whole materialist thing of, you know, that you, you, that you, your happiness depends on having all these things and getting rid of other things. It's and, external rather than external. Yes, external. yes, okay. So so in terms of the six realms, though, in terms of one story about heaven and hell. Yeah. Uh, and, then I'll, and then I'll... No, no, we, we, we got to start wrapping up. Oh, oh, dear, okay. About six minutes. Oh. Okay, oh, okay. Well, heaven and hell, story about heaven and hell. Um, Hell is a place where you go in and there's a big table, a big round table, and it's filled with food, wonderful food, all the best food in this restaurant, and the people are sitting around the table in hell, and they're, they're, they look miserable and scrawny, and they're, they're, they have big forks and knives strapped to their forearms, and they can't get the food into their mouths. Heaven, on the other hand, is a place where you go in and there's this big table filled up with food, and, and the people around it look very happy and fulfilled, and, they're, and they're, they have these big uh, forks and spoons uh, tie, tie, strapped to their forearms, and they're feeding each other across the table. Are the near-death experiences that some people report, like Dr. Ibn Alexander, consistent with Buddhism? Yeah, and there are, there, you know, so um, I've had a number of them myself. Um, and yes, uh, there is... Um, so that's a whole other question, um, and you know I can respond to that at length. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I recollect that I once saw a book, uh, which I never read, that had a title on it that was something like um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Repair. Yeah. With yeah. that yeah. in mind, Robert I would ask, shouldn't yeah. you own a motorcycle? <laughs> no, it doesn't mean that everybody who has uh, who does Zen should do motorcycle, but that's a good book. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Uh, it's Robert, actually more about Greek philosophy. Robert Piercing. Yes, um, and I knew his son. Um, oh, really? Um, it's a very, it's a, yeah, that's a good book. I recommend it. I read it a long time ago, uh, but it's it's from a Zen perspective about Greek philosophy. So, oh, okay. somebody behind you with yeah. In your final remark, I didn't speak during the rebuttal because you didn't mention this to your final remarks. You said President John Kennedy was planning on ending the war in Vietnam, taking all American soldiers out of Vietnam yeah. and doing something about the Cold War. The thing about President Kennedy is absolutely incorrect. I'm not calling you a liar. Maybe you believe what you said. I'm just talking about what's reported in this one book that I recommend. Well, I know I know that story is circulated, but President Kennedy had absolutely no intention of ending the war in Vietnam. He was a big warmonger for two and a half years when he was president. He was bragging about how the Green Berets was a Peace Corps with rifles. And three weeks before he died, he murdered the president of South Vietnam and That's the head true. officer in South Vietnam. 
That's true. I just I, I would just recommend this book. Uh, this very thoroughly documented by uh, James Douglas with two S's at the end, uh, which is about the people who were behind the murder of Kennedy and why. And it's a very okay. interesting read. And, and you can then, you know, think about it. For Before we wrap up, tell us how people can get a hold of you. Tell us a little bit about your temple and your website if you have one. Yes, there are flyers. There are flyers here uh, for people here. Um, my website is www.ancientdragon.org. You can email their, their info at ancientdragon.org. For people here, it's just a half a block down the street on, on Irving Park. We have Sunday morning uh, meditation instruction uh, at 845. If you can't come Sunday mornings, email us and you can get uh, uh, information on, uh, we can arrange another time for you to get the introduction. The website again, please. www.ancientdragononeword.org. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.